So each week we do our best to answer some of your questions that you kindly send us um, either by social media or on email or in the comments down below the videos, on us videos especially. Yeah. Um, we've delved in and looked for some. Neil, have we got some good questions this week? We've got loads of questions. Uh, I'm going to kick it off. Did it say good? Didn't say, didn't, didn't say good. We've got loads of questions. Uh, I'm kicking off with uh, one, somebody giving us some info. Because we were talking about your tubs last week. Yes. Dylan Johnson's coming with uh, saying tubulars are significantly lighter because of the rim construction and pinch flat resistant. So tubular tyres, you know what those are? Yeah. Everyone yeah. at home, you know what those are? It's like a glued on tyre. No inner tube. The tube, it, the tyre is the inflatable the tube. part. Yeah. So cyclocross rider. Riders love them because they can run really low pressures. That's the idea. Oh, but with mountain okay. bikes, uh, the sidewalls are cotton, so the risk is tearing them. So that's why Nino stopped using them, apparently. Because yeah, we were talking about Nino shirt, he used yep. them, and we couldn't understand why. Oh, there you go. Thank you very much, Dylan. That's um, very cool, actually. Yeah. Maybe we should do a video on you trying out some tubs. Yeah. Yeah. And then we could do a video of you trying to get them off your rim. Gluing them to the rim looks like a right pain. Right. Didn't Let's, me. yeah, <laughs> moving on. Let's dive into the first question. That is from Marcel Miro said, tapered versus non-tapered. What is the difference? Please answer. Love the vids. Uh, talking about head tubes head and tubes. forks. Uh, yeah. So it makes the, so it's one and one eighth at the top, one and one half inches at the bottom. Yeah. And it makes the head, the bike head tube stiffer because you can have a wider bearing at the bottom. Yeah, so it relates to the fork as well, doesn't it? Because it's yeah. basically the fork head tube can be a much stronger build. They did go 1.5, 1.5, but one point. Cannondale did that. And you could buy Not cups, so yeah. you could run different types yeah, of Yeah, and it also means you can mess around with angles and things yeah, like that. So head tube gets a bit bigger, there's more options. But, and strength. Yeah, not a huge, huge difference. Uh, if you're going to get a new bike, they probably all are tapered, aren't they now, I'd imagine? Yeah, and the thing is, is that unless you're actually going to mess around with your head angle or mm. you're going to, um, well, that's it really, you're not necessarily going to notice a difference unless you make the change to a different fork. you just got to make sure you get the right fork for your head tube. Yes. Because um, a non-tapered one would... You could fit a non-tapered to a tapered, but not the other way around. Yeah. Boring. I'm starting to go off head tubes, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, good question though, confusing. Uh, Airborne Boy 1, uh, it's been riding mountain bikes for about a year, he's thinking about getting some lock-on grips for his hardtail. Would you recommend any brands? <laughs> oh man, <laughs> every brand that makes lock-on grips, just buy any lock-on grip, they'll be brilliant. Ergon do some brilliant options, and yeah. we've got some really cool ones that are like Different extra thick, which I really like. I like the really thin ones. And there's the thin ones, there's tapered ones. Um, mm. I've tried, I don't know about you, but I've tried the uh, Brendan Fairclough Def Grip. Yep. Um, that's really cool. I yep. really like that. That's got some options. Uh, it's got like a old school mushroom grip at this, the, yeah. the thumb end of the grip and a, more of a traditional downhill style at the other end. That's quite cool. But what I would say, I don't know if you agree with me, Neil, is that lock-on grips change cycling forever. <laughs> grips before lock-on sucked. Especially big time. I used to race downhill in the wet in oh. England in winter and you'd be doing your run and your grip would slide off the end of the bar. And I've literally been riding and gone and just I've got a grip in my hand. Yeah. It's like, oh Jesus. Lock-on just solves everything. It's a good cheap upgrade. If you yeah, know. yeah, get a must, must have. Tim Z is planning a trip to England near London. Can you give me a a few good riding locations. Oh, where would you say? You must have some good. good Surrey options. Hills is really good. That is yeah. just southwest. Just More Brendan Fairclough. He's from there. Yeah, he is. Yeah. 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 Um, Bagshot has got some really cool lines. That's just off, never been there. just out west from London um, on the M4. There's lots of, which is a motorway in the UK. There's yeah. lots of trails there. Um, there's, some, they're all slightly outside of London, to be honest. There's. Yeah. Up Milton Keynes Way, there is Woburn, Chicksand. So I'm going north then. If you go west, you get to Wales pretty quick, but you've got to travel a little bit out of London. Yeah, cool. what I would say though is you have got a bike and you're in London, go and do some street because there's mm. some incredible street in London. Um, you you yeah. have to be careful because some bits you're not supposed to ride Buckingham on. Buckingham Palace? That's one of them. Oh. <laughs> That's one of them. Um, Lone Wolf says, I'm thinking of entering either a downhill or an enduro race, mm -hmm. but I'm worried that doing so will take the shine and fun off of riding because I'll be concentrating on being the best I can be. Did you ever feel that competing zapped your passion for riding, Neil Donahue? I don't think so. I love it because it's like this thing that you just... I don't know, the race ahead when you know you're being timed, mm. I find it an absolute buzz, especially when you finish. Mm. I think becoming a professional maybe did 
uh, zap my passion slightly, but the actual oh. racing didn't. Yeah. What about you, Martin? Um, Competing. The computer, I mean, when you're professional, oh, I don't know if it's when you're professional, but when people start to expect a certain thing from your riding, it, it, that's pressure. Mm. So that can be difficult to handle. But I don't think that's got much to do with feeling competitive. I think mm. if you feel competitive, you just do, and you want to do well. Yeah, I think true. if you can find a meaning in your riding, whether it's doing well or hitting a certain goal or just feeling a certain way, then it's then it's going to be incredibly rewarding. So um, competition can give you that meaning, and it can be really really amazing when you do say, well. Yeah, I would say try a few races, and you'll know straight away if you like it or not. Yeah, yeah. Like Some people don't. Blake doesn't yeah. like competing. Blake no. hates competing. Yeah, it just makes him feel sick and nervous, mm -hmm. and it does exactly that. It's just like not why he. Rides. He just wants to have a good time. Yeah, um, good and, time, Blake. And that's, and that's what he that's what he does. And he does it very well. <laughs> yes, yeah. he does. Um, but yeah, while we're talking about that, why don't we take a look at when Neil did did some did 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 did, did, the did do did. some competing <laughs> in the old Enduro World Series? Nearly killed the old boy, didn't it? it did. Let's take a look. <laughs> it's alright. Surprisingly clean run, actually. Uh, it's like a couple of really awkward type bits at start, but. I feel like it wasn't flowing very well, but then there's two nasty techy uphill bits that I nailed really well. Didn't think I was gonna. Left arm like a monkey on machine gun. Elliot Siviter says, when should we use a full face helmet and not an open face helmet? Now, Neil, that is a good question because I was deliberating that only last week for a new video I'm about <coughs> to do. And I was like, full face, open face. I was at the <coughs> point where I could get away with either. But I mean, I guess there is a, a you know, when are you buying an open face? When are you buying a full face? Well, if you look at racing, mm -hmm. final races, most of them, you have to wear a full face helmet because it's a dangerous sport. You yeah. often do hit your head and can't often get your hands out in time. Enduro, sort of 50-50. Some of them make you wear a full face, some they don't mind. And for me, it's sort of, that's how I ride. If I ride Enduro, most of the time I wear an open face helmet. If I'm going somewhere where it's uplifted, where I don't mm -hmm. have to pedal, I wear a full face because it's yeah. just safer. Up to you, a full face helmet is hotter, slightly less comfortable if you're pedaling long days mm. but if it's gnarly riding and you think there's a good chance you might fall off yeah then the old full face is required i mean i've got to be honest right i love i spent my whole career wearing open face helmets because i'm a trials rider and i'm not really going that fast um but since um i've been at gmb and i've been riding more trails and things like that mm. and i've been had the opportunity to wear a full face helmet and I love They're it. They're cool, aren't they? Oh man, it feels so cool when you're in there and you've got your goggles on. It's like everything feels better. That's weird. That's, oh, a, that's all I used to wear, but I rarely yeah. wear them now and it feels yeah. a bit claustrophobic putting a full face on, whereas oh, it used to I be really the, the norm for me. Yeah, but my new video, I'm going to wear an open face. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I've chose. I've chose it. But my, I've you're almost not, got not so old... worried about your looks. <laughs> no, I'm not too worried about my lips, not too, you know. <laughs> no, I've had the ego smashed right out of me. Um, right, John White says, quick question, it's about 18 lines it's long. It's not a quick you? question. It's oh, John, you go, John you go. Wintle. Is it possible to directly link any particular e-bike brand, this is GMBM, not EMBM, but we'll go for it anyway, uh, motor or bike manufacturer directly to a Garmin device to collect and record actual data for things such as power output and cadence straight from the bike itself? Ooh. Yada, yada, yada. Yes. Um, <laughs> Specialised will work with the Garmin your Phoenix 5 watch. That's the one I'm modelling here. I've got here. one of them coming. I've got one, one of these. Coming. And I'll tell you your battery life, things like that. Um, I don't know about your power output. I know the app, Specialised app on your phone, will tell you how much power you've put in, how much bike the power's put in after the ride. So that's quite simple. Just use the app. I don't know about the device, to be honest. I think the device is more about scrolling through your power modes telling you your battery level, etc. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to set one of these up. You, you love it, don't you? I love it. Yeah, can't it's wait great. to get one of those. All right, another one. Nathan Moray, uh, what do I do, what do I fix if I'm tipping either side after about 50 meters in a manual? 50 meters, pretty good. I can wheelie for as long as I want. I use my knees to tip side to side, but I can't do that in a manual. Oh, well, I tell you what, what you might find is, you know, when you're doing a manual, you get that thing where you kind of get hang time on your arms. And after a bit of distance, you've kind of used all of that bit of flex you're holding there, mm. and you end up getting to a bit of a stretch point. And what you find then is you lose a lot of your maneuverability on the bike. So you might find that something's really good to do is, as you're running out of speed and that strength, is give it a real push and bring the bars 
over to one side or the other, and you'll suddenly get a kind of going. Yeah. And usually that's enough to re kind of calibrate your system uh, and kind of adjust to that speed. So I'd suggest as your arms stretch out and you're like, oh, coming up to 50 meters, then I've measured that, that's a long way. You bring those arms in and get a bit of a right, let's go again. And then you'll be back here fighting it again, and you'll find you've got your balance point. Good tips. That's what I'd say. I was just gonna say practice. <laughs> uh, Lucas Imovol uh, is, hi guys, I'm in Austria. Uh, where I live, there's absolutely no trail riding or trail building groups. Damn. But there's some spots in the woods where it'd be possible to build one. How do I find out the owner of the land? Because I won't build illegally. Cheers, Lucas. Good, don't build illegally, that sucks. I've never done that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, it's hard to know how to find the owner of the land in somewhere where I'm not at. Um, I've done, I've done both. I've built legally and illegally. Sometimes illegally is sort of, it's fine. Not fine, but you know, people aren't going to be bothered. It's big forest, no one's there, they don't really mind. It's only when lots of people show up and they want to ride their bikes. It yeah. can become a problem. I guess issues these days, you have to think about insurance and all sorts of things and, um, you know, where does the blame land if you do build a trail somewhere on someone else's trail? Is it their fault because you could get on the trail, not your fault because you built one? It's very confusing. I mean, I would strongly suggest you find out getting permission. This guy's nuts. Wouldn't listen to him. I have one piece of advice I would have is go on trail forks. Try and just scroll everywhere. I bet there's some trails and I yeah. bet you can find the people that are riding them. Get involved with the, the crew, the club, whatever it is, yeah. and yeah. try and ride with them. Good advice. You saved yourself there, yeah. you? you saved yourself. You're sounding like a crazy loon for a bit. Let's right. move on. Come on, we're, we're now into Correct Me If I'm Wrong. Oh, so amazing. You guys send in your videos via the uploader. Find the link to the uploader down below this video. Anyway, this is Eric, and he's in Belgium, and he's riding his Scott Genius. Uh, yeah, he's one of the oldest guys in the group. He's 60 years old, riding this Stop. ramp. This is the video of Eric. Look at this ramp. Check out Eric's jump. And he's in his 60s and check out the jersey. There seems to be, oh, he's got one of my favorite jerseys on. I had that one on the other day. Love that orange. All right, that is a kicky ramp. Yeah. Boom, that's all right. That's all right, yeah, that's all right. I like it. Go a bit bigger. Come on, let's see it go a bit bigger. Yes. Yeah, he's got good style, eh? Cool. Oh, he's handling it very good. Never too old to learn how to jump. Yeah. I'll tell you what I do, just to, I'm not going to correct you because you're doing it right, but what I would suggest you do with that ramp, it's a yeah. really nice ramp, is just put it on the, um, if you can find an, a, a bank and you put the ramp on the top and just start going off that ramp and into the down slope and you'll get a lovely little step down. You could do it really small and just grow it. You don't want to go too big because that's a kicky old ramp. Yeah. But you could do it quite low speed, just get a nice little kick and then into that downslope, you better start putting a bit of shape on it, and suddenly you're like, Rrrr! and you're looking at the downslope, the bike's behind you, you're like, I am rad, and then you like, yeah. pull in, and yeah. Yeah, never too late for a bit of that, Patrick. 60 year old whips. Uh, nice. Right, we've got another one here, we've got one more, because this is all about trials. Oh, what? This is from Spencer. Oh, yeah, amend this. Colorado Springs. You're a Nice, nice. Nice, what's he doing? No, oh, oh, he's trying to gap. It's all looped out. Well, I mean, you're on a full sus bike, so it's extra difficult. Who's better at back ops? You or Martin Hawes? Martin Hawes is very good at back ops. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know what? There was a point in his career where he was doing, um, he's doing really good on back ops, actually. Seriously. And I was like, he's up to his level on the back ops. Mm. But I mean, we're talking at well, a back hot level, you guys, normal guys, just wouldn't understand. Is that when my, Martin and Martin almost split up and went their different ways? Uh, we never really split up. I think you'll find we're still a duo. <laughs> we're just not very busy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to fixing this little bit of back hopping. Um, you've got to let the front drop before you go on that gap. That's the problem. Ah, oh, you've got to let it go. Whoop. Let it go down and then go. It. Yeah, because the problem is you're, you're really high with a front wheel. Uh, and then all you can do from that point is really loop out. But if you go to the edge, let the front wheel drop. The more you can let it drop, the more you're going to be able to boom, pop it out. Nice. Uh, do that on big drops as well. Works. There you go, Spencer. Good advice. We couldn't get Martin Hawes, unfortunately, to give you some better advice. So <laughs> that'll have to do for Martin. I'll try and get him on the phone, though, because he's a smart dude, too. He could probably do this a lot better than I can. Um, thanks for watching this week. It's been a lot of fun. If you'd like to see some things that went wrong for some of our viewers out there, then you can click here to see our very best crashes from the month, and they were horrendous. Over here for Blake and his bro going camping in a very cold North Wales. Absolutely. Hit the old button there and subscribe. We'll see you next time.